everyone, and welcome to this webinar hosted by Jen. Our topic today is Accelerating mRNA LNP Formulation Screening for Genomic Drug Discovery and Development. Today's webinar is sponsored by Unchained Labs. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Uduak Thomas, Senior Editor with Jen, and I'm delighted to be your host for today's webinar. We have three speakers lined up for you today. Dr. Arpan Desai is the Managing Director for Nanovation Therapeutics UK. Dr. Graham Hayes is a Senior Scientist at Nanovation Therapeutics UK. And Dr. Ben Nappet is Product Manager for LNP Solutions at Unchained Labs. Before we get started, let's get some background on today's topic. Lipid nanoparticle-based mRNA technology enabled the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines, resulting in unprecedented interest in the technology's potential. Many researchers approached the design issue via systematic optimization of lipidic components, such as the ionizable lipid, PEG lipid, structural and helper lipids. However, these approaches are limited by the low throughput and high cost of LNP preparation. In this Gen webinar, our speakers will discuss strategies and tools for rapidly formulating and characterizing LNPs for drug discovery and development. They will share results from a collaboration between Unchained Labs and Nanovation Therapeutics UK to evaluate instrumentation for high throughput controlled manufacture of LNPs at small scales, and they'll demonstrate how their findings will accelerate the creation of LNP-based medicines. Before we begin, a reminder that we'd love to take your questions following our main presentations. Please enter your questions at any time in the Ask a Question panel on your screen. All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us here today. My name is Ben Nappett. I am the product manager for LNP Solutions products uh, at Unchained Labs. And I'm excited to be joined here today by R. Pandesai and Graham Hayes from Nanovation Therapeutics for this webinar on accelerating formulation and characterization of LNP based genomic medicines using high throughput screening. So, here at Unchained, we're very excited to have just launched two new products for LNP synthesis in the last month that will help our customers accelerate and simplify the process of developing LMPs for novel therapies and nanomedicines. So I'm pleased to introduce to you the Sunny Suite. The sunscreen and sunshine systems are here to help you unleash your LMP synthesis and quickly shine a light on winning formulations uh, and scale them up with ease. These systems allow seamless transfer uh, from screening large numbers of formulations into fine tuning the process parameters and then ultimately continuous flow production of materials uh, using the same microfluidic devices and pumping technology. So the reason today we're gonna to talk about screening in particular as a challenge faced by the industry is that screening is hard. There are a large number of different potential variables to consider when screening. There's the cargo type you're going to use. There's all the different types of lipid components in your particle. As well as that, there's process variables like the mixer type that you're using, as well as the flow rate ratio, total flow rate, the N to P ratio of your formulation. And you can even think about buffers and dilution um, as part of, that, that con part of that challenge as well. So there's a lot of variability here, a lot of potential parameters that we could vary. And if we take each of those parameters, uh, nine in front of us here, and we say we're going to explore them with 10 data points per variable, you can do some simple scaling up maths. And as a brute force problem, there are a billion potential different combinations of those parameters and those variables. So we have a big challenge in trying to learn quickly and focus in on the parameter spaces that are showing the most promise and the most uh, value in terms of creating a particle that has the right level of performance for your application. So there's obviously some ways we can do that. We can we learn from all of the experiments we do. So having a quick turnaround time between formulating and characterizing experiments and then getting that data back so you can plan the next set of experiments. Having a short cycle time there is really important. Um, as well as being able to try and keep costs down, have a consistent process uh, and try and make the whole thing as viable as possible to churn through large numbers. Because there's no way of escaping it. There's going to be a very large number of experiments to try and tackle. And that's where 
sunscreen comes in. Sunscreen has a 96 well plate format, allowing you to have your reagents and collected samples in a format that transfers and works really well with uh, upstream and downstream processes for high throughput. Um, and you have full automation once your experiments are running. So it is a walk away system once you set it going. We can work with volumes down to 100 microliters per input. So that could be as little as 200 microliters per experiment, which makes a really big difference to the costs when you're talking about doing hundreds or even thousands of experiments as part of your screening project. Add in reusable microfluidics and an ability to transfer your process directly from our screening platform onto process optimization and continuous throughput with Sunshine, then Sunscreen really is one of a kind as a solution for nanoparticle formulation and screening. And by using Sunscreen in combination with a stunner from Unchained Labs, you have 96 well plate based particle size analysis and RNA quantification as well. So the combination of the two means that you can formulate, synthesize, and characterize 96 samples in a single working day. So as I said, I'm really excited to be joined by Arpan Sai and Graham Hayes from Innovation Therapeutics. We're currently working with both of these systems. Uh, I'm working on screening lipid libraries um, to identify specific combinations of lipids to show prom promising performance in vivo. Innovation of leading innovators in developing uh, novel uh, nucleic acid therapeutics, creating a toolbox of solutions to really help progress the field of nanomedicine development. Arpan's the managing director of Nanovation UK, and Graham is one of the senior scientists who's been working extensively with both the sunscreen and sun sunner systems. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to hand over to Arpan. Thanks, Ben. So, um, this talk is going to be about um, the work we've been doing with Unchained Labs to develop and evaluate um, some technology for increasing the, the throughput of formulation of characterization of lipid nanoparticles. So I'll just start with an introduction of the Nanovation team. So what we're about at Nanovation is innovating in the lipid nanoparticle space. So we were founded um, out of Peter Cullis's lab in, in Canada um, and Part of the idea behind Nanovation is to create hubs at different parts of the world. And the UK is the first hub of Nanovation. And this is where this work was um, done. But really, we have a lot of history of innovating in the lipid nanoparticle design space. And where we try to differentiate ourselves is go after the difficult stuff, do the difficult things like extra hepatic delivery or trying to really advance our knowledge and understanding of the structure of particles. That's what we're, we're really about. So for those who are not familiar, lipid nanoparticles are an essential delivery vehicle for gene therapies. And without these systems, you know, gene therapies uh, would not work. It's as simple as that. And the lipid nanoparticle there is there to protect the nucleic acid from degradation and also these are very sophisticated carriers which interact with cells and is a way of getting a large molecule like an RNA or a DNA into cells. So this is kind of what the system looks like. It's a complicated system. You know, you can see a simple graphic like this, but what we're really looking at is thousands of molecules of lipids. And in terms of mRNA, depending on the size, we'd estimate there's two to six mRNAs in each particle. Making, therefore, how you make them is really important. So having a controlled way to, to form these particles um, is critical to make an LMP with the right quality to have good biological performance. So this is a sim simple diagram of how we do it. We have the lipids in ethanol, and then we have the nucleic acids in a, in a aqueous phase. And we, we mix them together and there's an electrostatic interaction, which happens at low pH, which causes encapsulation. And then we do a dialysis step to get rid of the ethanol to get our LMPs. The state of the art of this um, is that there are three LMPs which are approved products. The first one was with Anylum, which was an LMP designed um, to, to target the live and deliver siRNA. And then there's the two uh, COVID vaccines, which has really advanced the the field and um, the science of the field and really showing the impact and the power that it can have. In a bit more detail, 
um, these are the specific components of what's in the Pfizer vaccine. So the ionizable lipid is what I would call the brains of the operation. And the ionizable lipid is, is very exquisitely designed to essentially go into endosomes and lysosomes and disrupt the endosomes and lysosomes to release the RNA, which is a key step uh, in the process of intracellular delivery. And this uh, ionizable lipid was discovered um, through a company that came out of Peter's lab um, called uh, Acuitas. But there are also other different um, lipids in there which are important as well. So we think about all of these together. Now, you know, I think lipid nanoparts and RNA have changed the world and had a huge impact, but there's still a lot more optimization to do looking at liver-based diseases, some of these um, lipid nanoparticles have a narrow therapeutic window. Some of these lipids cause immune stimulation. There's challenges repeat dosing them. So if you have a therapy where you have to dose a lot of them, the therapeutic window can block what we can do. With vaccines, we know that the, the products that we've have have to be frozen. There's improvements happening all the time to try and remove the need for that frozen cold chain and really the the one on the on the right here is the one that's really like the holy grail and that's expanding to extra hepatic tissues and applications outside of vaccines and to do that you know we really need to have a step change in how we design these systems and that's what we're really trying to do at innovation having a complex system means that there's so much many different combinations of lipids the design space is, is pretty much infinite so there's a lot of things that we can do now a big problem that we have as innovators in the delivery science space is that making lots of lmps and rna is very time consuming and expensive and that's partly because of the materials and the consumables involved so what we've been really trying to do is, is look for a way that we can really explore all the ideas that we want to do, but still make it kind of um, viable and sustainable from a time and cost perspective. So this is where we we started a collaboration with Unchained Labs and um, Ben. So previously I've worked with um, trying to do small scale LMP manufacture with simply pipette mixing. However, we found that that can be a bit variable and also use kind of standard methods of microfluidic mixing. And the problem with that is that the scale that you, you use them is quite large. So we're really looking for somebody to work with who's got a small scale um, instrument. And the thing that I really liked about Ben and his team was that they really, they don't do standard things, they, they, they're innovators in this space. And, you know, these are complex systems. So wanted to work with people who really understand the technology and understand the various different parameters and things that we're trying to optimize and are able to solve solutions with us. So what we did was we were asking the question, well, can we use this instrumentation to accelerate our LMP uh, innovation engine? And what we're going to talk about is uh, the work we've done in that space. So the person who's been leading that is Graham, who's a senior scientist um, in our team. And I'm going to hand over to him, who's going to talk you through the, the data and the evaluation. Okay. Thank you, Arpan. Okay. So as uh, Arpan mentioned, uh, I'm a senior scientist at Innovation, and my role in the last few months has been to try and validate uh, the sunscreen compared to our standard method of um, formulating LMPs. So the key question for us is how does the quality of LMPs compare uh, when we look at the sunscreen versus our existing method? So there are a few criteria that we set that would be critical for us to say that these two methods would be comparable. Uh, and you can see them down here. So we've got the kind of biophysical characteristics, so the size and the structure, and also the encapsulation of RNA or nucleic acid. Uh, and then we're also it's important for us to be able to have in vitro and in vivo compar comparability between the two methods. Um, so this was the kind of experiment that I designed to try and begin validating um, the two methods. So what I did is I took, um, I made stock solutions of both the lipid and the RNA for the, for the LMP. Um, and then I split those up into different aliquots. And then I was going to use these two different aliquots for either our standard method of mixing or mixing on the sunscreen. Um, 
So then once these were formulated, I would then do the dialysis with a three kilovolt molecular weight cutoff dialysis membrane as normal. Um, so the LMP selection I chose is down here on the bottom. So I chose two benchmarks. So the Al Nylon Monpatra formulation, as on as uh, Arpan mentioned earlier, uh, and then the Pfizer formulation as well and then i chose three proprietary lmp formulations from nanovation and i selected these because of their wide range of characteristics that we've seen so i wanted to test a whole range of stuff to see to really test how comparable these two methods were going to be so on this slide we can see uh, the size measurements for each LMP. So down here on the bottom, we've got the Onpatro in blue, Pfizer in orange, and then our three proprietary LMPs in the other colors. So the bars indicate the size, the Z average, as measured on the stunner, which we've been using from on-chain labs for several months. And we use this on a daily basis. This has been a, this has been a great, a great instrument for us. Uh, and then the dots, you can see the PDI. And what we can say here is that the size is for every single LMP between the standard method of mixing and the sunscreen method, they're identical. So we were pretty happy with this. Next, we wanted to look at uh, the cryo EM images. So I took some cryo EM images of on Patro, the on Patro formulation and the Pfizer formulation made by a made via the standard method of mixing and the sunscreen method and we can see the on patro one they're the spherical homogenous they're around about 50 to 100 nanometers and you can see that between the standard method and the microfluidic sunscreen method this, the, the particles look identical um, with the Pfizer one this one typically has this slightly unusual structure in that you can see it's it's not spherical um, and you have this bleb structure which we think is where the rna is encapsulated um, and this is very typical for the pfizer formulation but once again you can see the lmps made by e by either method look very very similar so we, again we were very happy with the with these results uh, we then moved on to the encapsulation so the encapsulation is done, uh, we use an RNA assay kit, a ribogreen, which is a ribogreen fluorescence-based quantification kit. And we can measure how much RNA is unencapsulated. And we can see, again, that the results across all the LMPs for both methods are essentially identical. And we can we, you can see that if, if you have high encapsulation for one method, then that's typically repeated for the other method. And if you see a slightly lower, so this one's around about 80%, that's also repeated with the other method. So uh, everything at the moment is looking very nice. Um, and then we wanted to move on to some slightly more complex analysis. So we look, started looking at um, the in vitro uh, performance of both LMP sets. So here we use HEPG2 cells, um, and these are kind of, pro these are hepatocyte cells. So this is a proxy for um, liver activity and we do di dose titrations for all of the LMPs going from a thousand nanograms down to 10 nanograms so in orange you can see the LMPs that are made by the sunscreen and in blue you can see the ones that are made by our standard method of mixing I mean, you can see in general there's going to be a little bit more variability between this because of the nature of the in vitro testing but in general you can see, say, for example, the Pfizer ones, these are almost identical. Uh, and then LMPX, very, very similar again. And you can see for LMPY, we have a slightly unusual dose titration, which is repeated in both cases. And we can see here for LMPZ that the high dose, much, much higher for the sunscreen method. But you can also see that this is repeated with the standard method. So this this is kind of at this point we were pretty we were pretty convinced that both methods were making are making exactly the same types of particle no matter what the morphology or or the composition are so then to finish off our, our validation we looked at some in vivo testing so the pipeline for this it kind of works in that we administer the lmps to the mice then we wait for four hours and then we administer a substrate then after 10 minutes, we do an in vivo image. Uh, and then what we do is we 
dissect the liver into its individual lobes and then we sum the total amount of luminescence we see from each lobe and that gives us an output of efficacy essentially so over here on the right we can see some example images of the mice and we can see that the fire generally pfizer gives us very high readings across the board and we can see that that's repeated for both methods uh, and then the on patro one slightly lower but again very very similar and then looking at the actual values, we can see that on Patro, the uh, this method, they're very, very repeatable. And again, for the Pfizer, and we can see for the standard method of mixing, we have a 3.8 times fold change between on Patro and Pfizer, and it's 5.6 for on Patro and Pfizer for the sunscreen method. There's even more chance for, for variability here, but these results, these results confirm for us that the sunscreen is a viable method to make LMPs. And to summarize all of the data, we're of the opinion that they make identical LMPs, essentially. All of the all of the quality criteria have been met. And we're now using this as a regular tool to screen wide varieties of LMP formulation. Okay, so to conclude the validation experiments that I've done, we're very happy with the high throughput formulation techniques that um Unchained Labs have provided us with. So the sunscreen makes identical particles for us. Um, and I should also mention that uh, we've regularly been using the stunner instrument to measure sizes, RNA concentrations, and measure RNA quality throughout multiple projects. Um, so both of these instruments have been, have been and will be key for us in the future to make LMPs in a high throughput way. Thank you for listening to me. I'll pass over to Arpan for the summary slide. Thank you. So I'll just um, summarize the impact that this has had on our R&D program. So what the, what the stunner and the sunscreen mean is that we can make LMPs a lot faster um, and with a lot less material. Um, for example, Graham last week made 60 LMPs, which took about three hours to make. Whereas if we were going to, if we did that with our standard method, that would take several days, potentially weeks to, to do that. And it's also been done with approximately 10, 10 times less uh, material as well. So that simply wouldn't be possible with our standard method. And what it means is that the, the elements that you can see uh, in our toolbox that we're optimizing on this slide is we can just explore more and more design space. And it ultimately means we create better LMPs and it means that we're going to be able to make more medicines for patients. And a very warm welcome to the live Q&A portion of today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got some great questions that have come in. A quick reminder that if you do have a question, please go ahead and put it in the Ask a Question panel on your screen. We'll be taking several questions over the next few minutes. All of our speakers are here, Ben, Arpen, and Graham, and they're ready to take your questions, so please do keep them coming. Thank you all for joining me today. All right, I will go ahead and get started. We've got a few questions to get through. Um, first question I have, how long is the mRNA stable at room temperature, I believe that is? Uh, Sunny Sweet Solutions does not currently offer thermoregulated well plates. Um, who'd like to take that one? Uh, yeah, I can start with that one. So uh, you're right, it's a room temperature system at the moment. Um, the, 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 the plates themselves are uh, covered with seals. So the, the RNA itself is protected from contamination during the run time which really helps uh, significantly with the stability at room temperature. Um, also, we've done tests internally of the kind of first well, um, you know, we synthesize uh, our particles and then wait six hours as a worst case sort of scenario of a longer, longer plate run, um, and then measure those uh, samples and test them for um, transfection efficiency and also keeping reagents on the inputs for, for a similar amount of time, six hours, and then turning them into a particle um, for processing and, and testing encapsulation efficiency. Um, and we get good results uh, on encapsulation efficiency for either of those so we can show stability of the RNA you know, through the duration of a well plate when you cover the wells and prepare the RNA cleanly. It's obviously something that might be a little bit variable depending on the RNA you're, you're using. Um, and so there's nothing that obliges you to necessarily run at a full six hours of experiments. If you wish to break it up into smaller chunks and, and run in blocks to start downstream processing sooner, that's something that's perfectly fine uh, to do. Uh, but I'd also, uh, 
offer that question up to, to Arpan and Graham for comment. You guys have been using it fairly extensively. How have you found it? Yes, please. You want to go first, Graham? Yeah, sure. Um, we haven't really specifically looked at RNA stability over time. Um, I think this is a potential issue, but I think we're pretty confident that RNA stability is somewhat overblown. Um, so, uh, I've, yeah, I mean, this is something this is something to look at. But I feel like leaving RNA at room temperature for a, two hours in a sealed container, as Ben suggests, sh is not going to be a problem. Yeah, um, I think what I'd say, I think th there's a lot we're learning about uh, stability, and I think it can be a function of uh, your your lipids that you're using as well. So I think there's a, you know there's a lot of nice work from Moderna and other colleagues who shows having certain impurities in your lipids can affect uh, well cause reactions with the RNA and cause degradation. So I think. Um, that equation is you, you do have the temperature issue but it's going to depend on what lipids you're using and i guess in in our evaluation we used a range of different kinds of uh, lipids and a kind of different kinds of compositions and um i guess if there was a significant issue at room temperature when we did our in vitro evaluation some of these the, the rna would i guess not be active anymore and we didn't really see any big red flags in the, in that area so i think that's the kind of evidence back at what a bit what um, Brian was suggesting there. Absolutely. Thank you all. Moving on to the next question we have for 96 formulations, what are the different variables we can opt for all four lipids in one run? And then there's a second part to that question. Does it have four inputs for lipids or do we start with premix with a premix or extreme? So, so that is a, the, the lipid uh, input plate. You premix the lipid composition that you want to run for each individual experiment into the plate. So the system aspirates the whole contents of a single well to run an experiment and then moves on to the next. But it means you can have unique formulation blends in each individual well. Um, so, so that's the, um, the use case for the, the lipids. In terms of variables that you can change, you can change the total flow rate, the flow rate ratio, the amount of dilution you add, uh, a head and tail cut that's user definable per experiment to, to target your collection to the center of your sample if you wish. Um, so yeah, there's a few different things you can play around with on a per experiment level within the, the, the experimental spreadsheet that you, you plan and upload your experiments from. And then obviously between runs as well, you can change the sunny, the microfluidic mixer to, to try different mixing geometries as well. So uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of flexibility built into the system uh, for you to play around and experiment with what works best for your formulations. Excellent, excellent. Arpen Graham, did you want to add anything? I, I mean, I, I just, I just add. I think that like the most amazing system would be if you can like program your specific combination of lipids in, and it just does it for you. That you know, I'm sure Ben will come up with that someday. How, but it's it'd be quite complicated to do. But the way it is at the moment with a plate, and if you just use like a multi-channel pipette to to make your premixes. I mean, it's pretty, I, I, I would say, you're not going to save huge amounts of time. Um, I, I imagine, I think it's 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 not that hard to do to make a lot of combinations of different kinds of lipid nanoparticles quite quickly um, with pre-mixing. Would you agree, Graham? Yeah, I, that's mostly what I've been doing recently with, with um, the instrument is mixing novel lipid compositions other than the four kind of standard lipids that people use. Um, it's not as bad as you might think. <laughs> um, but yeah, as Arpen says, any, a system where you can have all the premixed lipids, all the lipids coming in together, that would be ideal. But yeah. Yeah. Because when we were designing the system, we were trying to come up with the right kind of balance and compromise between overall costs, time saved, and what, you know, how much we bit off in terms of which parts of this process we tackle. So we took on the automating the microfluidics aspect of it, knowing that there are some robotic fluid handling systems out there that if you wish to use those already to, to, to automate that pre-prep -prep of the plate, um, you could do that. 
Um, but the time saved, you know, the, the, if you look at the workflow of trying to do those 96 experiments one by one with a with a typical microfluidic system, the running of the experiments and, you know, loading up the samples each time individually is where most of the time can be saved. And that individual, you know, once you can, as you say, you know, use multi-channel pipettes to prep the plate, and you've got a convenient format into which you can prep, that time, um, you know, the cost benefit of you know, making the system vastly more complicated to, to eradicate that last few percentage points of time saved because it's probably something that will be too much for most people. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And just a reminder to our audience, we're taking questions live. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and enter it into the Ask a Question panel. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can during the live session today. All right, moving on to the next one. What conditions and chip was used on the sunshine? Did you measure the, oh, this is a multi-parter. Did you measure the cryo-M for different chip configurations and how did they compare? Yeah, so we know the uh, chip we've been normally using is, I can't remember what it's called, but it's just a kind of T-mix type shape. Yeah, um, the, junction, the junction next to junction, chip. Junction, yeah, that's the one. Um, so yeah, we've just been using that um, initially to look at our, to look at the validation side of things. I haven't yet looked at using different chips for and then looking at the the particles by cryo EM, but it's it's another thing on the list of things I'd like to try. Yeah, certainly. Um, Arpin, please. Yeah, so I mean, just on the, on the background, so when we started our collaboration with um, Unchained Labs, we we kind of came down to see them and we find that they've got, uh, one thing we really liked was there's, there's lots of tinkerers and there's people making these chips um, in the workshop in the place I'm in now. And um, one thing that I was kind of, uh, I thought there was a lot of potential in it is that the fact that they have the expertise to make a lot of different kinds of chip geometries. Um, so, um, I think one of the advantages of that is like if if you want to do like different like you want to mix things in different orders or you want to try out something which is a bit funky like um you know you want to do different kinds of dilutions and stuff like that uh one of the things that attracted is that it, it seemed like they can make any chips you want so i think that that's a really interesting area that you know i i think is interesting to explore absolutely absolutely thank you What's the benefit of using Stunner over a typical DLS plate reader? Uh, I'll take that. One. So the the Stunner the Stunner has DLS and UV Viz built into the same instrument, which is pretty nice because it means with a very very small amount of reagent, this is something else that's a huge benefit. It's only two microliters of your of your sample that's actually needed to run uh, run uh, on the Stunner. Uh, so loading in two microliters of sample, you get DLS, so your size, PDI, and you get total RNA quantification um, in a single measurement. So within an hour, you can get full 96 well plate analyzed. And actually that we've been doing tests since early and getting really nice results using that total RNA concentration value as essentially half of the ribogreen assay uh, data that needs collecting. So you just need to measure your free RNA with the ribogreen rather than having to analyze the particle and measure the total RNA because you already have that data. Um, so that downstream encapsulation efficiency workflow is halved um, and you, know, you get more data in a, in a, in a single measurement. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty pretty nice system. Pretty happy to have one in the, in the lab here. Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to keep moving along. We've got lots of questions coming in, so we're going to try to get through as many as we can. Uh, but audience, please keep them coming. How could the sunscreen platform be used to improve the transfection efficiency of LNPs? Um, who'd like to start with that one? Uh, I I can I can give it a stab. So a, a very good good question. So and you know exactly what we're we're trying to do. Um, it, it, essentially you, what I, i'd say is that it just um it, it because it, it reduce means less reagents and it reduces the cost of screening like large libraries of combinations of compositions so um it, it enables us to explore design spaces that previously would have been um you know just too expensive to go down so i think graham mentioned it things like um introducing a new lipid and then um looking at a range of different comp different ratios of that lipid um 
you can do those kind of things and then um, explore hypotheses around improving transfection. So um, yeah, diff more a bigger design space, I would say. And Graham, anything to add? Yeah, I would say that there are other added parameters that the, the sunscreen can work with, like the mixing rate in different chips and stuff. And I mean, these things have the potential to alter transfection. Um, it's not something we've looked at, but yeah, it's something that should be looked at. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, I'm going to try to read this correctly. Um, sunscreen uses microfluidics. Um, I think this is how can contamination be avoided in between formulations, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Sure. So the, the system is set up using um, what we call driving fluids, which are typically just the ethanol and your aqueous buffer with, without anything uh, added into it in storage bottles on the top of the system. And these fluids are used to hydraulically fill the system and then push your samples around the, um, around the system to the microfluidic mixer and then into collection. Those same fluids get pushed through. So after your sample goes through, it's followed by the driving fluid, um, which cleans the um, sample straight out of the out of the chip. And then we end up with um, a, a, we have a cleaning step that then actively happens in between every experiment. So more driving fluid is then actively flushed through the the, the system. Now that's user definable, so you can kind of set the set the level of, of that um, cleaning as well. Um, which which helps a lot if you know you're working with a, a you know a stickier solution and you want to put um, you know, more cleaning material through you can set it to do that automatically um, and even further than that if you wanted to put in a if you're switching fundamentally between some different lipid types and you wanted a more aggressive clean you can actually use one of the wells on the well plate to load in a cleaning solution so one of your runs is a is a cleaning solution that goes through is then swept through the system and then you start the next row of experiments um, to, to, to be extra thorough. So there's lots of ways that you can implement additional cleaning, but it's built into the system automatically, happens between every experiment. Excellent. Moving on to the next question, why did you choose the 3K MWCO dialyze, dialyzers? I hope I pronounced that correctly. And how do they compare with the 30, 50 and 100K ones? Um, we initially chose those because those are the ones that we've been using historically. So we wanted them for, for comparable reasons, really. Um, sorry, what was the second part? Why didn't we use the larger? How, how did they, how did it compare to 30, 50 and 100 K ones? I'm not sure we've looked at this. I think we have some in the lab. Um, yeah, don't take my word for this. I think I think they're I think they're very similar. The results we get, but I yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, Arpen, Ben, did either of you want to weigh in on this one as well? Uh, no, I, th I think Graham Graham covered it. Excellent. All right, moving on to the next one. Um, does the equipment evaluate RNA integrity, and what approach do you use regarding this important quality attribute? So the device itself doesn't have it built into it. It's it's a formulation device, so we prepare the samples, and then um, you know RNA integrity is something that you can easily measure um, downstream, um, whether that's using a kind of a plate based solution to do that or um, or just by um, inference when you do your transfection or in vitro and in vivo testing. Um, again, I can I, I defer to, to Arpan and Graham as to you know how you've been monitoring that and you know inferring the stability from your from your test data. Yeah, so I mean empirically through the trans looking at the transfection activity, um, we you know we don't routinely do like a specialized RNA integrity assay. But I think as we learn more, I, I think it's it's something you know, I'd be keen to kind of think about in our workflow. And, you know, you can do it with a like a fragment analyzer to have a look at your RNA integrity. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we don't we don't routinely do it. But yeah, I, th I think we should consider it more and more. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Moving on to the next one, what kind of throughput? Okay, this is a multi-part question, so I'm happy to repeat any components if necessary. What kind of throughput are you screening on a regular basis? So for example, how many LMPs per week? How long does it take in total to make the LNP libraries and then analyze them all on the stunner? 
Does Unchained Labs provide other instruments that can assess other biophysical characteristics of LNPs at high throughput? So maybe we start with the first one. What kind of throughput are you screening on a regular basis? Um, yeah, so we're using it pretty much weekly. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I made 60 LMPs in one run, um, preparing the lipids. And I was making quite a diverse range of lipid compositions. Uh, it was quite complicated and it required a lot of concentration. Um, to prepare all the lipid concentration, all the lipid stocks and all the RNA stocks took me maybe two and a half hours. Then I left it to run, which took maybe four hours. I went and had lunch. Then I did the dialysis step, which took maybe half an hour to prepare all of that. And then the next day, putting them all in the stunner plate takes, I don't know, 15 minutes. Um, and then doing encapsulation and stuff like that, which takes, it takes a little while, maybe another hour. So, I mean, you can, you can measure, you can analyze and analyze and make 96 LMPs in a couple of days. And it only takes two days because you have to do, we do the dialysis overnight. Brad, do you, do you mean it, it takes a lot of mental concentration or lipid concentration? Mental <laughs> concentration. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so the second part of the question, how long does it take in total to make the LNP libraries and then analyze them? I think we may have touched a little yeah, so bit. Two, two days. Two yeah. Days. Okay. All right. And then the final component to this question, does Unchained Labs provide other instruments that can assess other biophysical characteristics of LNPs at high throughput? Yeah, so Unchained have a, a range of different instruments that um, have previously been sold in the kind of biologics and gene therapy space. Um, so there are a variety of different tools that could potentially be used. Um, some some released in other markets initially, but um, you know, it was a strong interest for us in the LMP team to get our hands on more kit and do more testing. So, you know, we have um, you know 96 well plate based buffer exchange with the big tuna system. Um, the uncle system is able to do stability measurements on particles and some thermal ramp rates and things like that. So yeah, there, there are other tools available. If you're, if you're interested in some of the stuff that's not been not been kind of covered in this webinar, please do feel free to get in touch and we can get you in touch with the right specialists and some more information on those products as well. So yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, moving on to our next audience question. How many runs can you do before the microfluidics have to be replaced? Good question. I'll take that one. So we 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 don't oblige anybody to 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 replace anything on a specific interval. We give some guidance and advice on that. It depends on you know you as the user how heavily you're using the system. We typically advise for a kind of expected amount of uh, of typical use. You're know, running a plate or two a week, maybe of, of samples through the system. Um, that the the tubing kit and the the glass syringes on the pumps probably be replacing um, every every three to six months. Um, the sunnies, the mixing devices themselves, again, we don't limit the number of times you can use those. Uh, Graham, I presume you use the same one for all 60 of those experiments and um, ready, it's clean and ready to use again. So, um, you know, they're, they're highly reusable. Um, I would work on the basis of potentially budgeting for replacing it once a month or two, um, depending on, um, you know, risk of risk of having a, a blockage. You know, it's possible when you're screening that you just get bad formulations, you end up with a, a stubborn blockage. And at that point, um, you know, replacing replacing the, the, the sunny and a few spares is, is, is good practice. But yeah, so the, the replacement intervals are, you know, then it's not something that you're looking at doing daily or weekly. Um, these are these are monthly or, or, or annual replacements. So um, yeah, so there's, there's good reusability out of all of the wet flow path in terms of the per experiment cost that was one of the real drivers for designing and releasing the system was to get that per experiment cost down so that these larger numbers of experiments become feasible excellent, excellent. um and just to remind our audience one more time we're taking live questions so if you do have a question please go ahead and enter that in the ask a question panel on your screen and we'll try to get to it as as but we'll try to get through as many as we can all right, moving on to the next question that we have. If you if you would make 96 identical LNPs with the sunscreen system, how different are the properties? So size, encapsulation efficiency, for example, of the first and last sample? So we've done data on the first and last sample. Um, and that, so we do have some data on that internally that we measured um, making um, you know, SM102 um, 
luciferase RNA um, LMPs. Um, and we saw good reproducibility between the, the first and last on the well. There's also some data in, I believe this in the sunscreen brochure, you can see where we have run a full plate of 96 uh, DOTAP LMPs, and you can see the data for, for all of those. Um, and the for, there were 90 identical repeats, and we threw in six samples where we left out the pegylated lipid um, and to, to intentionally trigger some larger particle size with poorer PDIs and look at recovery from that. Um, and for the 90 samples that were identical repeats of one another, we got a less than 1% CV on, on the size. So it's highly reproducible in terms of producing particles of consistent quality run to run, um, which means that hopefully that feels people will eliminate the need to do quite so many repeats, for example, to, 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 to try and get valid data. You can you can really trust the integrity of the, of the samples being measured, which is which is good. Excellent, excellent. Arpan, Graham, did you want to weigh in on this question too? Um, only that we've made Pfizer and Onpatro compositions between batches and they always look pretty comparable. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. All right, next question. So uh, we prepare a plate with, with the required combination of the lipids in the wells. Is it a covered plate? And if not, uh, ethanol will evaporate and the concentration will be different over time. So I think they're asking if the plate is covered, yes. Yeah, yeah, so we, we, we're compatible with um, well plate seals. So we supply the system with two different types. We recommend using a foil, a heat sealed foil plate on the input, um, because if you once you've got a heat sealed foil on there, um, you really prevent all evaporation from, from those samples. Obviously once the, the needle from the system punches a hole in the foil, it leaves a hole in the top surface. So for the inputs, that's no problem because you've already aspirated all that material and you're onto the next experiments. On the collection plate, you don't really want it to be stabbing a hole in your seal and then leaving a kind of permanent hole there for, for the, how long the rest of your run is. So um, we also provide pre-scored um, plate covers. So those pre-scored plates that, that kind of flaps and then fold apart when the needle goes through to deposit the sample. And then as the needle comes back out, the plates kind of recover. So those also prevent the majority of evaporation uh, as well. And particularly, um, you know, contamination ingress as well, which you want to absolutely avoid with these samples. Excellent. Is it possible to formulate different lipids in each well? Yeah, so you, you guys can take that if you want. You've been doing a lot of different lipid testing. Yeah, so we do that regularly. Um, we designed a calculator to allow us to formulate basically whatever lipid composition you want. Um, so we we you can make 96 LMPs all with completely different lipids if you wanted to. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Next question. What is the minimum and maximum output for for the sunscreen system? So it's compatible with uh, two milliliter deep well plates. So the upper collection limit is two milliliters. Uh, and on the lower end of collection, um, you can go down to around 100 microliters. Um, typical experiment volumes, if you're running a three to one ratio, a typical low volume experiment is normally around 400 microliters. So for most people taking a small head and tail cut from that, you might be collecting around 300 microliters in reality. It can go down to lower, but obviously that means discarding more of your uh, more of your sample that you've been running. So um, yeah, so that, that gives you an idea of what like a typical experiment would be like. Um, Arpan and Graham, I don't know what sort of volume is actually you're typically running um, each of these formulations at. Yeah, so we're running around about a milliliter. Um, you could go less than up the concentration if you wanted to, because we're using ours for in vitro testing, so we need a certain amount of RNA. Um, but yeah, around about a milliliter, but you could go down if you wanted to. Excellent. All right, next question. Have you checked the LNPs from your standard method and those of sunscreen for nanotoxicology in vivo? Arpen, Graham, would good, you like good, to Yeah, good question. No, we haven't, um, but I guess we've observed the protein expression to be very similar. So, um, I yeah, and the, you know, the structure looks very similar and the in vitro expression looks similar. So I'd be very surprised if it is, if it, do, it does turn out to be different. I think um, I, one thing I was really pleased with was with, with the in vitro result, there was, if you see the data, there's one LMP which had a really funny dose response um, where essentially like the mid dose was the best and then the, the highest dose was worst. And that kind of replicated on both 
um, our standard method and the sunscreen method. So to me, um, that indicates that like that even if it's like there's like something subtle going on, it, it replicates on both methods. So to me, that gave me gave me quite a lot of confidence. Graham, did you want to uh, weigh in at all? I, I think Arpen's pretty much covered it. We do look at in vitro tox toxicity. Generally, everything is always is always fine. So it's not. I mean, it's not a great. It's not a great assay, really. Yeah. Right. Excellent. All right, next question. Are demos available for the sunscreen device? I think this one might be for you, Ben. Yeah, um, by all means, get in touch if you're interested in a demo. We There's a range of different options of how we can go about that. So if you want to see one in action or see one uh, on a virtual, on a video call, we can, we can set something up. So yeah, do let us know if that's something that you'd be interested in. Excellent. All right, the next question we have, how many aqueous buffers and lipid stocks can be loaded simultaneously in your device for LNP preparation? So the you can load 96 unique formulations of RNA, 96 unique formulations of, of LNPs, every single one of those in each well could be different. The one thing that's consistent um, for every experiment that you run on the system is the driving fluids. So the bulk fluids you load into the bottles on the top of the system are used for every experiment. Um, hence, typically we use a, we use a, a, a comparable buffer um, in the um, in the driving fluid for the RNA line, for example. But again, if you use anti-dispersion technology that prevents the, the driving fluid from intermixing with the, the sample slug, there's no reason you can't use a different buffer or a different pH or concentration in your actual sample reservoir and then collect that. Um, so so yeah, um, that's the that's the difference between what goes in the well and what's used to push the push those fluids around the system. Excellent, excellent. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Arpan, I'm gonna come to you for this one. Uh, can you tell us more about, uh, any more about your previous production method? Um, so I, I, I can't reveal all the details about it, but what I would say is um, it's it, it, it's it's not the, the um, Ignite method. We have our own uh, custom method of making LMPs through a, a, a control mixing process. Um, the the reason we, we we did explore the sunscreen is that that process that we've got, um, it takes much larger volumes and larger amounts of RNA that you have to put through it um, to, to enable it to work. So yeah, that's a... Great, thank you. And I'm actually going to stay with you for this next question. Um, did you use design of experiments uh, with sunscreen? Uh, yeah, I think by design of experiments, we mean like, um, you know, altering the different combinations of things in a systematic uh, way. A absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that's, it it's one of the things that you can do with this, which is uh, much harder to do when you have like a mid scale kind of system. So yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that's what, yeah, we do that. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more and Ben, I'm going to come to you for that one. How does the validation spreadsheet work? Oh, sure. So that's um, that's an Excel-based tool. Uh, so you simply prepare all of your experiments in that spreadsheet. It's got a series of different tabs and a little how-to guide at the front. The, you can input experiment-wide parameters like setting, as I previously mentioned, you can set your wash level. You can choose which of the sunny microfluidic devices you want to run with. Um, give a description, all those kinds of things. On the main experimental planning tab, you have a big table where you can input your um, flow rate ratios, the amount of dilution, the total volume of sample you want to collect, specify the head and tail cut volumes, and then you can add some metadata for each experiment you want to run. And what the system, what well, the spreadsheet will do is look at the data you've input, calculate what that means in terms of the pump flow rates that need to be set and the volumes that need to be processed. And it will just give you a green cell to tell you that that experiment was valid. And if it's not, it'll go red and it will show you why it's red. And that lets you pre-plan all of your tests ahead of time. If you put in something that was a bit wacky and it, the system can't quite run it, you'll know that way before you get down to actually run your experiments and prep all your reagents and things like that. So it's a really, it's a handy way to just be sure that the experiments you've planned out are going to all run just fine when you get down to the lab. Um, and it also has some nice schemas of the well plates um, telling you what volumes of what formulations need adding, which is kind of handy um, when you get down to, to actually start prepping the plates. Excellent. 
Um, so yeah, and that's just a simple file that you then save and then import directly into the software before hitting run. So it's it's helpful to have that pre-check before you plan everything. So you don't have to be down in the lab planning all your experiments. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all so much. That is all the time we have for today's webinar. As mentioned, this webinar will be available on demand shortly for repeat viewing or to share with colleagues who might not have been able to join us today. So please keep an eye on your email. Uh, you should get a link within the next 24 to 48 hours um, and you can view the webinar at that point, including this live Q&A. Many thanks to Arpen, Graham and Ben for a great discussion today and for taking time to answer so many questions. We appreciate you. A special thank you to our sponsor, Unchained Labs. And I'd also like to shout out the Gen Multimedia Group for hosting this event. And that team is made up of Leanna Jabs, David Mosley, and Hannah Turner. But most of all, thank you so much to you, our audience, for watching today. For everyone at Gen, I'm Uduak Thomas. Thank you so much once again, and goodbye for now. <laughs>